This is uh, the most substantial thing we've cut, I'm sure. Correct? Yeah, I'd say so. Ten inch pieces are sufficient. Okay, so what we're cutting is 1x4 flat bar, A36. Um, we got a fairly aggressive steret blade in the saw. Uh, I think it's a 8 to 10 TPI variable pitch blade. So we're going to get some coolant going. And we need 10 inch pieces, we need six 10 inch pieces. certainly faster than I could do by hand. I'm going to increase the, intens the tension on the uh, down feed a little bit and I'm going to time this one 
And then I'm going to switch over for the last few cuts. I have some vintage 4 TPI, so 4 teeth per inch blades, which are, you know, obviously for very thick stock. And I'm going to compare the cut time on that. Half inch out the back gives me a 10 inch piece. Do you have your uh, phone with you? Yeah. You want to start a stopwatch? Get ready. Let me hear the first. Yeah, one second. And I'm going to run this tension up. Okay. Ready? Yeah. feed rack uh, shifted. Remember how that one uh, mounting foot was broken on the underside? Not really. Yeah, this, this feed rack uh, bolts to the underside of the bed and uh, one, of the, one of the mounting feet, it's like the slot that the, the screw traps in was was broken and it now I see that it shifted so the, the feed poles won't engage squarely. I don't know if I should continue running it. I, I could try to just feed it by hand, holding holding down force it's on going it. going to break it more if you let it go wiggling around like that? Well, it's not engaging at all. No, I mean, whatever is unbolted on the bottom I don't, let me see. I can't get it to, uh, I can't get it to down feed at all. It's cutting so well. Well, now the Peerless Power Hacksaw is down. And if you can see this, this is the guide um, for the rack, the feed rack. Actually, this piece is what is bolted to the machine frame, and it is skewed because the mounting foot which bolts from the underside this part of the the one tab was broken off so I have a bolt in there that's only holding through half a slot and it decided to basically squirm out of position this way and the feed rack the feed poles are those two items right there they're not engaging the face of the rack anymore so it won't feed it won't cut 
and it's time that I take that piece out right there and braise the foot back onto it, which I've never done. Uh, hopefully I can clamp it flat on the welding table, V it out from the top, get it brazed halfway through, and then flip it over, V out the other side, and, and finish brazing it. And then it'll be strong enough to hold it in place. But cutting that 1x4 flat bar with that heavy, aggressive blade and a lot of feed pressure just uh, was a little bit too much vibration. And that uh, that uh, feed feed rack holder squirmed out of position. Hall Industries is a fab shop and machine shop that I use for work. But he has done a couple of government jobs for me. So I headed up there to Fishersville, Virginia um, to get these uh, pieces cut and to get my 916 holes drilled in them. And we're going to be using the uh, American Hole Wizard uh, radial drill that's in his uh, machine shop side. It doesn't even need to be just, just centered up and right. buzz through it. And I'm just going to try to stop if you don't mind. I've got a set of 10 inches, so I'll just... Yeah, it's hard. As and... long as it doesn't start wandering, yeah, wa wandering off my lines, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm gonna trust that. Because I think I, I think I set those based on my fat ass power hacksaw blade. <laughs> he has a bandsaw that'll do miters 45 yeah. degrees each way, and I, I don't have the, the make of this oh, item, but uh, it's an, you know, an auto feeding bandsaw. Looks like it'll cut some pretty, uh, pretty wide stock, maybe 24 inches. To the column your 10 inches on that first piece and then I can and he's just going to set this up and knock these the pieces out for me. flip it buzz it through from the back because then all my, all your marks are visible right i mean that way you don't have to try to feed through that that existing slot gotcha Yeah, it's not terrible, but it's not totally straight, you know? <laughs> nope. So this table's completely separate from the base of the machine. Mm -hmm. This table's completely separate from the base of the machine. You just hold, build it around it. Right we had a taper shank drill um, that he wanted to use in place of the chuck. So we're trying to, trying to get that knocked out. And uh, 
I think the first wedge he had was <laughs> didn't come to a small enough tip. So what kind of feed you set up on a hole like this? Kind of feed. I don't know, but what are you doing? Videoing. Whatever works best. You might notice a socket on the table there. Um, I had drilled out the uh, three-quarter inch square drive with a hole saw and we put that into a lathe and uh, opened up the, the hole to a clearance hole about an inch and a half. And that socket's going to be used um, on the Skinner steam engine. Going to have to cut a slot in it and then bolt a, like a breaker bar of sorts onto the back or weld it so I could use it to loosen the jam nut on the uh, crosshead slide. It's a 2 and 3 eighths nut that that socket um, is going to fit on. But it has to fit over the piston. Miles is letting me run the American Hole Wizard. I'm just getting the hand-eye coordination is a trick, but man, this thing works and, and moves so smooth. You just the inertia that you have to remember when you move the arm or the head back and forth. You could do that. See, so machining is mostly just standing around, right? When you drill two inches thick. Yeah. Unless you want to go over and put on the CNC and it dug by itself. Uh, per hour rate on those machines is too high. Yeah, it's a little more higher. Tooling costs a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send you a drill bit. It's like a big one I got over there, the foot on it. Uh huh. The arm will come out nine feet. But the foot right here is only like 
four foot. Five uh -huh. foot. So it was specially made for something big to come in there and sit on the floor. Right. And that thing swung around and drilled it. This one here will go either way. You actually can swing this. You can swing this thing all the way. That's a table over there, too. Oh, okay. So this has got the table on the back side. This is the most fun I've had in a long time. I can see why the people with radial drills love them. I don't know how else I'd do this effectively. And these holes aren't even that big, they're just 9 16 But through one inch material, we're here we're stacking two pieces, so two inches. Got some plates here for the trolley beam. These are one by four flat bar A36, drilled for uh, half inch tie rods. These are actually 9 16 drilled holes. One plate is going to be welded to the underside of the trolley beam, and then the other plate is going to be sitting on top of the building framing, and then the tie rods hold the top to the bottom. So we got a pair of those at each end of the beam, then at the center of the beam I have a plate that will be bolted to the top flange and then at the apex of the roof we have another cross piece with two tie rods and that will be there to load share, take some of the load from the trolley beam up to the building frame. Uh, those tie rods will not be run in completely tight and tensioned. They'll just be set to the length and then as the trolley beam begins to deflect it will share the load to the building frame through those tie rods and I have a little bit of drop from that uh, operation. There were three sets of three by three by quarter inch angle pieces welded onto the one side of the beam. They were obviously some sort of a diagonal brace uh, back when this beam was a part of another building. Uh, I might have mentioned before in one of the previous videos that there is remnants of um, same size beam welded to these at right angles and that's why they had the, the gussets there one foot from the, the end of the beam. I'm going to leave those in place and those will be my end stops for the trolley. Then just beyond those <coughs> web braces I will have um, the uh, the one by four plate with the tie rods supporting the beam from the underside of the of the building frame. It was tough cutting all these these welds. They were run right up to the edge of the flange, and so I had to cut as much of them as I could, and then use a combination of brute force and leverage, you know, hammering with a sledgehammer and pry bar to get the welds to to break free. On some of them I had to cut down vertically to uh, give, give room for the grinder to get in and get at the weld beads. But once I got them off, the remnants of the, the weld cleaned off pretty easily. On the other side of the beam, where I took off the intermediate stiffeners and torched those out, there's a lot of material to be removed there to get that cleaned up and that's going to take me, I, I would imagine, another four or five hours of grinding, which doesn't make for too interesting of a video.
I hope you enjoyed that visit up to Hall Industries. Miles and I got a routine uh, when I come up to do an inspection of equipment that he's building. He complains about the tolerances I put on things and I tell him, well, I can take them to a shop that can hold them instead. And you know, we just, we have a good time giving each other a hard time. But uh, no, it's serious. He, he does fantastic work and it's one of those deals where, you know, I know good machine shops and I know good fab shops, but Miles has both. He's got he's got guys that are machinists in the one building that you saw, and then uh, on the other side of the building is the you know fab area. He's got fantastic welders that that can just you know do do awesome work. We do some housings that are uh, hermetically sealed, and you know the welds have to be 100% gas tight. So. Um, you know, they, they do those housings, been doing them for years. They built special fixtures to vacuum test them and pressure test them. Uh, just, uh, I've, I've got a 20 year relationship with him and I'm familiar with his work. So, um, did some more work on the beam. I still got probably a good four hours worth of welding. Uh, my son wants me to completely grind these flush so they're pretty when they're painted. And I got rid of the artifacts from the diagonal braces on, on this side of the beam. Those cleaned up pretty quickly. Um, next, we'll get into welding on the those, those uh, carrier plates that we drilled the holes in uh, onto the underside of the beam and some two by two angle for uh, lateral support. And that'll be, that'll be the next phase in the beam. And then we'll be ready for paint and uh, try to figure out a way to hoist this thing up and install it. So thanks again for all your uh, attention, for all your subscriptions. Uh, share, like, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Engineer's Workshop.